to have. Praise God. While people are coming back in, let me just say, I was over with the youth this morning. We had over a hundred youth in there, and I tell you, they're they're really listening, and I believe they got ministered to, so praise God. I believe your young people are going to be excited about the Lord. Be good. I was just over in the UK, and we held a what we call Grace and Faith Conference over there. We had about 1,500 or so, and we had a youth service, and... Uh, I got over there and they, they did a quiz. And they got to asking me questions. And these were Bible questions, but they were impossible to answer. And every time I failed to answer, I had to do uh, something as punishment. One of them was get up with the guitar and lead praise and worship. And I led, oh, happy day. They had a big time out of that. And then... Uh, Another one, they had me uh, riding piggyback on a guy. Another one, they had me blindfolded, and I painted a guy's face with uh, makeup and stuff. And, and another one, they had David Hardesty and me there, and we were putting marshmallows in our mouth and trying to quote scriptures. <laughs> and David won. He cheated because, because he was eating his marshmallows. You weren't supposed to eat them. And I had a whole mouth full of marshmallows trying to talk, and he could quote every scripture. And so that wasn't fair. But anyway, it was fun, and we did all of this. And then uh, I got to minister to him. And I tell you, we had a powerful move of God in the U.K. They had uh, one girl there that had already attempted suicide, and she had determined that she was going to commit suicide during the week. And she got turned on to the Lord, man, and excited, and she was fired up. And we had uh, people that were just, it was just powerful. And they were asking questions about how do they stand. They were being persecuted because of their faith in the Lord. And it was really powerful. It's one of the few times I really, really, really enjoyed ministering to the youth. Praise God. <laughs> A few years back, Mike and Carrie, they're the ones that are doing our youth. I'm surprised they've ever asked me back. But they asked me to come in and minister to the youth, and there was about 100 kids there, and there was about a dozen or so on the back row. And uh, they were wearing all of this, you know, gothic stuff, and they were had their arms folded like this, and they were looking at me, and you could tell they didn't want to be there. And so I just got up and started by saying, I know you don't want to be here. Your parents drug you and you don't want to hear me. And I said, I don't want to talk to you. I said, I hate ministering to you. <laughs> Boy, they all just looked at me like this. And I said, I hate ministering to you because you guys don't love God. You're here checking out the girls, checking out the boys. And you're here because your parents made you come. I said, I hate talking to you because you don't seek God. And I just got on their case. <laughs> and then... And then I ministered to them. And did you know that there was one girl who had made her so mad, she said, I'm going to seek God just to prove Him wrong. And she's now in our Bible college, amen. She's part of our Bible college. Too. So I repented of that bad attitude, but it did work, praise God. It, it, it worked out. But this group over here, it's really good, man. They were all worshiping the Lord, and I, every single one of them was listening to me this morning. So that's really, really good. Really good. I love youth. I just love youth that are seeking God. I, like, I don't like carnality. I don't care if it's in adults or youth. Amen. I'm not here to entertain people. Praise God. So we're going to give you another opportunity to give this morning. There may be some people here that, have, that weren't here last night and stuff, and we're going to receive an offering. There's a lot of expenses to this. Even though Caris Christian Center is donating their building, we will bless them. I'm not going to take advantage of anybody, and so we... We have expenses. We have a lot of staff. We've got a lot of people doing a lot of things. And uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to just give and be a part of that. Look at this verse in, Ephes in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. But it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall man give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Man, I could preach on this for days. I'm just going to say real quickly, this says that your giving determines your receiving. 
Most people want to receive big, but they want to give small. That's just amazing. But that is not how it works. It says, the last part of this, For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You know, God doesn't evaluate gifts based on dollar amounts or things like that. It's always percentages. That's the reason He said to give 10%. And so a person, if all you have is a dollar, did you know you could give 50 cents? And that would be a huge gift. That is a big measure. And on the other hand, there may be people that are millionaires that they give $1,000 and think that, you know, they've just done something special. And that is a very small measure. God looks at things in percentages. And if you give with a small measure... And I don't believe that this is only limited to what you actually give, but it's the attitude that you give in to. It also says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, it says, if you give all of your goods to feed the poor, or if you give your body to be burned, and don't do it motivated by love, it profits you nothing. So it's not just the physical gift and what percentage it is, but it's the attitude that it's given in. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 talks about God loves a cheerful giver, or maybe that's verse 7. But God loves a cheerful giver. So the attitude that you give with, if you give grudgingly and of necessity, and if it's like pulling teeth to get you to give, then you know that your response, your supply is going to come back that same way. You determine how things go in your life. If you give a small percentage, it doesn't matter what it is compared to somebody else's gift, whether it's small or whether it's large, But the percentage, if you give a very small percentage, God's going to give back to you using the same measure that you used. You know, that's like somebody that uses a little tiny eyedropper to give, but then wants a dump truck to come up and give them all of this stuff. God's going to use the same thing you used to give, to give back to you. You determine your blessing. I know some of you don't agree with that and you think, oh, it can't be that way. That's exactly what this verse is saying. And there's many other verses that go along with this same thing. You determine how blessed you are. And your giving is where it begins. It's not limited to giving. You also have to be a good steward. There's things that you need to learn. But your giving is absolutely essential. And if you want God's best, then you need to give your best. You know, David, when he went to offer a sacrifice, there was this angel that was going to destroy Jerusalem, and he saw this angel. The Lord opened up his eyes, and he went to offer a sacrifice, and the man who owned this threshing floor, he also saw this angel. And he was on his face when David got there, and David said, I want to buy this threshing floor and offer a sacrifice. That turned out to be the place that they built the temple in Jerusalem. And the man who owned the threshing floor said, No, I'm going to give it to you. Just take it. And he gave David everything he had, his threshing floor, his oxen to be for an offering and everything. But you know, David came back and he said, no, I'm going to pay you for it because I will not offer unto God that which has cost me nothing. In other words, he says, man, I am not going to give something to God that isn't a sacrifice on my part. And there's a lot of people that they just give what they can spare so that if the Word of God doesn't work, And if God doesn't give it back to you, good measure, press down, shake it together and run it over, well, then I can spare this. I'm okay without it. You know what? You need to be giving so that it's a sacrifice, so that you need God's Word to work. That's the reason God told us to give. He doesn't need our money. We need to trust Him, and He wants you to give, and He wants you to give in a way that it literally takes faith. You're dependent upon God to return this unto you. And I just want to encourage you in this offering today to give like you would like to receive. God's going to use the measure that you give, the attitude that you give in to give back to you. And that's precisely the reason that some people are struggling. Amen. Because your attitude and your your measure that you've been using hasn't been good. I encourage you to give and be generous and God will bless you for it. If you got one of those packets when you came in, there's an offering envelope in there that you can use. But if you need an offering envelope, we've got our ushers here. They'll get you an envelope if you'll hold your hand up. This is for cash giving. So if you need an envelope, just hold your hand up until one of our 
ushers reaches you and gives you an envelope. If you're giving by check, you can make it out to Andrew Womack Ministries or AWM. The information on your check should be sufficient. Praise the Lord. I heard that we had uh, 3,500 people watching online last night, and our servers went down. And so I don't know if many of them stuck with us until they got them back up, but hopefully people are coming back tonight, and I don't know what happened. All of that's Greek to me, but hopefully we'll, they'll get all of that fixed, and praise God. It's great to have those that are watching live streaming uh, today. And, you know, I'd like to encourage those of you watching by the Internet, you know, again, you can partake in this and you can be a part of the offerings and things like that. You can go right on our Internet site and give. Father, we love you and we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the truths. Father, I pray especially for people that are wanting a dump load full of of resources, but they're giving with an eyedropper, that you would help them to change the way that they give, that they would give on purpose that they would give generously, that they'd give with the right heart. And Father, I believe that as they do that, we just stand on this verse that when we give, it's going to be given back unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give into our bosom. Father, we thank you for that. And I speak that blessing over every person's gift today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. Amen. Well, I miss Wendell and most of Daniel. I got in on just the tail end, but I saw him, or I saw Gary ask about how many had ever heard a message like this on praise and worship, and nearly every hand went up. I've been very encouraged by the way that Daniel is ministering praise and worship in line with the grace of God and what God's already done. You don't hear that very often, so praise God. That is awesome. And I, don't, I assume that they said these things. If it's redundant, please forgive me. But Daniel is now doing a praise and worship school in our third year. Did you share with people about that? So anyway, that's really good. And uh, yesterday we had our director's meeting up in Woodland Park at our lodge up there. And we had Stephen Bransford, who's doing the media school, come up and present that. And I tell you, every director said, I want to sign up for it. It's just awesome. Barry Bennett right here runs our third year program. And Barry is going to be ministering what day? Thursday, Barry is ministering. You've got to come hear Barry Bennett. Man, he's a hit. People love Barry Bennett. I've had lots of people say, you used to be my favorite minister, but now Barry's my favorite. I think that's awesome. Amen. Because I asked him to come on staff, so I get credit for it. Amen. (laughs) So I just think that's awesome. We've got a tremendous teaching staff. I didn't hear Wendell either, but I've heard Wendell hundreds of times, and he's always a blessing. So Wendell, Wendell is just great. People love his teaching on the Holy Spirit. Everywhere I go, everybody loves Wendell, and I tell them, just wait until you get to know him. <laughs> he gets better the more you know him. Amen. He's a blessing. I tell you, God's doing great things. Wendell is actually having to go to Uganda. Uh, We've got a kind of a crisis in Uganda, so Wendell is leaving Wednesday night. He's scheduled to minister again, but you were going to have some kind of a world outreach thing on Thursday, and uh, we're going to have to cover for him, but appreciate him being available to do that and to take off and go to Uganda and take care of those things for us. But God's doing some awesome things in this ministry. I shared with our directors that a number of years ago, I was just sitting down and thinking about all God is doing. And the Lord gave me this little picture in my mind of Jamie and me pushing this huge boulder uphill. And it was like, it was so much effort and we were just barely moving. And if we would have stopped for a second to take a breath, that thing would have rolled back on us and smushed us. And that's the way that we were for about 20 years. It was like, Just every day, oh God, we need a miracle. And we just stood and believed God and it was hard. And then the Lord showed me it was like we reached the top of the hill and it was flat. And it was relatively easy. And when I started on television, everything just totally changed when I started on television. And people began to respond and our finances began to work. And it was relatively easy for a while. And then the Lord showed me that we were now on the downhill side of that 
And now the stone was rolling so fast, I was having to run with everything I had to keep up with it. And that's, that's really descriptive of where we are in the ministry. It just seemed like it was a struggle for years, and then we begin to start seeing people's lives change with relatively ease. And now God has brought all of these awesome people to us that are doing so many things. And I mean, Jamie and I are just having to... It's, it's like, how in the world can we keep up with everything that God's doing? He's opened up so many doors, so... I'm excited about what God's doing. Glad that you're a part of it. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. And in these morning sessions, I'm going to share with you, this is a very simple truth, but it's kind of a summary of a lot of things that I teach. And I have a teaching out there entitled, You've Already Got It, So Quit Trying to Get It. It's got a picture of a dog chasing his tail. And basically, that's the, those are the things that I'll be sharing along these lines. It'll be different. I always teach it differently, but if you'd like more information on this, that would be the teaching that would cover this. But these things right here are things that the Lord used to change my life. And let me just say that if you haven't heard my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, I would really encourage you to get that because, again, that's the foundation of everything that I teach. And because I saw that when you get born again, you're changed in the Spirit, and you become a new person in the Spirit, and in the Spirit, you're complete. You're already full grown. You're as perfect in your Spirit as you will be throughout eternity. And the rest of the Christian life isn't trying to get God to do something for you, but it's drawing out of you what God has already completed in your Spirit. Your three parts. And if you get your mind over here in agreement with your spirit, then that's two against one, and your body will just respond. You'll automatically see the blessing of God manifest in your emotions, in your finances, in your health. It's really that simple. It's not easy. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is get to where you're going by who you are in the Spirit and walking by faith and basing your life on what the Word says instead of what you feel and what people tell you. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but it's as simple as what I've just described. And one of the things that came out of that is just this understanding that I've already got it. I've already got everything. People are asking God to heal them when the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, by His stripes you were healed. If you were healed, why do you have to ask God to heal you? Because you don't believe you were healed. If you believe you were healed, you wouldn't be asking God to heal you. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> and see, people are saying, but I've got a doctor's report to prove that I'm not healed. I had one woman come up to me. I'm not trying to... Uh, nobody knows who I'm talking about but this one woman, so I'm not... Against you, I'm not trying to say anything, but they said, you prayed for me last year and nothing's happened. No manifestation. And they were asking for me to pray again. But see, that's not true. A lot has happened. It just hadn't happened in your physical body yet. And people are thinking, but well, what else is there? That's because you don't understand spirit, soul, and body. In the spirit, you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You don't need God to heal you. What you need to do is get what God placed in your spirit out through your mind into your physical body. And yet the average person is sitting there and saying, Oh God, touch me, not understanding that you're already touched. You are touched, amen. That's the problem. God's already done everything. You've already, the Bible says Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those things are already in your spirit. When you're saying, oh God, I'm so sad, God, would you please touch me? You've solved the problem. Some of you are saying, how does that solve the problem? Because your spirit is rejoicing. Your spirit has love, joy, and peace. If you're saying, I'm so sad, you have identified the problem. You aren't in the spirit. You aren't basing your life on what you have in the spirit. You're going by how you feel. And that's the problem. The truth is, the whole time you're depressed and discouraged and just, you know, everything's falling apart. Your spirit, man, is always rejoicing. It is always full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, 
meekness, and temperance. When you feel like you're wanting to punch this person's lights out, did you know that your heart, your spirit man, is loving them? You have God's unspeakable love. And somebody said, I do not. I don't feel it. <laughs> well, see, that goes back again to this teaching on spirit, soul, and body. That you, spirit is spirit, flesh is flesh. You can't feel the spirit. Now, that's going to bother some of you because you all of the time say, oh, we feel the spirit. I'm not going to get off and teach on all of this. I'm just saying this as introduction. But you can't feel the spirit. You can perceive by faith, and faith is tangible. And there is an anointing of God that is tangible, but spirit is spirit and flesh is flesh. You can't feel the love of God just in some physical, natural, carnal way. You have to perceive it by faith. You have to take what the Word of God says. But the truth is, see, if you understood that you always have joy in your heart, then I don't care when you feel like crying. You could just by faith start releasing what you have. And it is so much easier to release something that you believe that you have than it is to get God to do something for you that He hasn't done. Especially when the Word of God says, by His stripes you were healed. And you say, oh God, I know that the Word says that, but I, I'm not. This is what you say, but I say I'm not healed. I got a doctor's report to prove that I'm not healed. I've got pain to prove that I'm not here. All that proves is you hadn't got it in your physical body yet, but you do have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. And instead of starting in opposition to what God says, you ought to agree with God. And you ought to pray something like, Father, thank you that I do have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling on the inside of me. I've got it. I've already got it. I'm not trying to get it. I've already got it. Now I just take my authority and I command what is true in my spirit man to come through my soul and dominate this physical body. Dominate my emotions. Dominate my physical body. Dominate my bank account. That's so much different than the attitude that most people take where they are begging God to do something. So look here in Ephesians, and let me just teach this to you. Uh, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, and Paul wrote this entire book of Galatians from the perspective that I just described. Some people struggle with the book of Ephesians because it seems like, man, I just don't understand this. It doesn't match my experience. That's because you're walking in the flesh. You're going by what you feel instead of by who you are in Christ. This whole book of Ephesians is written from the standpoint of being in Christ Jesus and what you have in your spirit man. And if you don't understand that, then you won't understand the book of Ephesians. But this, there are radical things said in here. For instance, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You know, the wording here in the King James is a little awkward. Sometimes I've had people say, well, this is talking about that it's in a spiritual realm. It's in heaven. It's in heavenly places, but it's not a reality here on this earth. This is just an awkward way of saying it. If you look this up in the NIV and the Amplified and stuff, it says, one of those, I forget which one right now, says, He's blessed us with all earthly and spiritual blessings. This is just a way of saying that God has already blessed you with everything. You've already got it. People say, oh man, I need God to come through and I need a house payment. God's already blessed you with the same power that He used to provide all of these miracles, it's already on the inside of you. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant as He swore unto your fathers. God doesn't give you money. God gave you the power to get money. That's important. People are just all the time praying and saying, Oh God, please, I need some money. And you just pray and then you wait on a 
on the money to fall out of the sky or just something to happen and you're just waiting on something to happen. God doesn't give you money. He gave you power to get wealth. He gave you an anointing. In your born-again spirit, you have the Creator God living on the inside of you and He gave you His power that He used to create everything. You have creative power. And you, He gave you promises that you set your hand unto anything and it shall prosper. And yet there's many people that just sit there and ask for God to come through and I'm just waiting on God. No, you aren't. You, God's not the one who's late. You aren't waiting on God. God gave you power and what you need to do is get up and set your hand unto something. Pray for creative ideas. Go do something. And believe for it to prosper. Some people will think, well, I'm not, I wouldn't be dependent upon God. I'm just doing it myself. No, you, you are doing things, but you're expecting a supernatural blessing on it. It will come back to you. It's like the disciples in the fifth chapter of the book of Luke. They fished all night long on their own and caught nothing. But then Jesus came and said, let down your nets again. And they said, Master, we've been fishing all night long. There aren't any fish in this lake. Amen. We can't catch anything. And they said, nevertheless, at your word, we will let down the net. You ought to go study that in Luke chapter 5. He said, let down your nets, plural. And they said, we'll let down one net. They didn't expect much, so they didn't do much. And you know what? They were overwhelmed. Their net broke and part of the catch was lost because they didn't obey what he told them to do. Man, you got to think big. That's right. That's right. They did the exact same thing they'd been doing all night, but when you do it at the command of the Lord, you get supernatural results. Yeah. I had a guy one time that uh, he was starving, and I gave him money and helped keep him alive. He was a member of our church, but he just wouldn't work. He'd been a Baptist pastor. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He left his church. He moved over to where I was in Childress, Texas, and he was living with some other people in kind of a communal situation. And they were just praying and studying the Word all day, but they were hungry. And they weren't eating and things weren't going good. And I gave him some money to help keep him going. And finally, I got to telling him some of these exact same things I'm saying right here. I said, God gave you power to get well. Go do something. He said he had blessed what you set your hand unto. A hundred times zero is zero. Do something. A hundred times one is a hundred. I said, do something. And he says, well, back before I got turned on to the Lord, he, he uh, fixed cars, dents and things like this and upholstery and stuff. And he said, anytime I needed money, I would just, I had cards printed up and I'd walk downtown and I'd see cars that had a uh, broken windshield or a dent and I, I'd make an estimate and maybe it was $300 to repair the car. And he says... This is what a normal repair is, $300, but, you know, I need the money. If you will uh, do it today or this week, I'll do it for half price. And he'd just write that on his card, stick it under their windshield wiper, and he says, by the end of the day, I'd have enough work to last me for a month. He says, that's what I used to do all the time when I was in the world. I said, why don't you do it now? And he says, well, because that wouldn't be depending upon God. He says, that would be trusting my flesh. And I said, you know what? You need to go do this. And I made the guy go print up some cards and sure enough, he stuck them under there and he had supernatural results. He had better results than he ever got when he was just doing it on his own. But you got to do something. God gives you power to get wealth. And yet the average Christian is just sitting here and instead of taking charge and using their authority and commanding their body to be well and fighting the devil and resisting and doing the things that the Word says... They're just sitting there watching as the stomach turns on the television and waiting on God and can't understand why they aren't well. God's already done His part. By His stripes you were healed. Now you've got to believe that you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings. God's already given you everything. And if you don't see what God's Word says that He's given you, it's not because God didn't give it. It's because you haven't released it and drawn it out. But this changes your entire attitude. It changes your whole approach towards everything. We are not in the process of just waiting on God to do things. God has already accomplished everything He's ever going to accomplish through Jesus. 
Let me make a statement that will offend some of you, shock some of you, depress some of you at first, but if you'll listen you'll, and get it, it'll help you. God's through healing people. He's through saving people. God doesn't bless people today. He's already done that through Jesus 2,000 years ago. And what happens is, if you will confess Jesus as your Lord, it's not Jesus who all of a sudden comes, rises up and comes and hangs on the cross and dies for you and forgives your sin. He's already done it. When you confess Jesus as your Lord, you just receive what was already provided 2,000 years ago for you. Your sins were already forgiven, but the moment you put faith in it, then it becomes a reality in your life, and you receive it. But God doesn't save people today. He saved everyone who would ever be saved 2,000 years ago. People receive salvation today. People receive healings today. People receive joy and peace today. But the truth is, He's already done it. You've already been blessed. When you got born again, in your spirit, you were given everything that God has. In your spirit, you are complete in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You're complete in Him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. As Jesus is. Not as Jesus is going to be or something, but as Jesus is right this minute, so are you in this world. It didn't say you were going to be that way when we all get to heaven. You are identical to Jesus right now. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That word means a singular one, identical. You're identical to Jesus. People go look in the mirror and say, this is identical to Jesus. It's not your body and it's not your mind, but in your spirit. You are identical to Jesus. You've got everything that Jesus has. You are as blessed as Jesus is. You have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says you have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3.10 says, And put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that has created him. With your mind, you may not be able to remember where your glasses are. But with your spirit, you know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Not some things, all things. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the whole Christian life is meant to be lived from who you are in the spirit. What happened to you at the new birth? And yet most Christians don't know what they have and they spend their entire Christian life asking God to bless them when the Bible says you're already blessed. Oh, God, heal me. By His stripes you were healed. Oh, God, give me money. I've already given you the power to get wealth. I'll bless whatever you set your hand unto. And anything you're asking for, you've already got it. You don't need God to give you something. You need to renew your mind and find out what you've got and start believing and release what God has put on the inside of you. Man, that's huge. That's huge. Most of the body of Christ believes God can do anything but that He has done nothing. And so they are in a process of trying to get God to do something. I'm telling you, God anticipated your every need and before you even had the need, He created the supply. And on the inside of you, when you got born again, He gave you everything you will ever need. There is never a situation that will come your way that you don't already have the power and the anointing of God to be able to deal with that and solve that problem. It's not out there somewhere, it's in here. Lack of understanding this is why people come up with all the weird doctrines about how that we've got demons blocking our prayers, getting up to God, and so we've got to get people together and we've got to create a hole in the atmosphere so our prayers can get up to God. I know some of you are laughing. Hopefully you hadn't heard that. But did you know that 10 years ago in the body of Christ, spiritual warfare conferences were the biggest things going. They were drawing more people than anybody else. And this was the whole thing that there are demons over an area that control things and our prayers can't get through to God. And we got to have a clear heaven. Have any of you heard all of this teaching? And you got to get rid of the demons. And somebody's saying, oh, now wait a minute. 
Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10, it does say that the prince of Persia withstood Daniel's prayers for 21 days and there was a demonic opposition. And I agree with all of that. But that was an old covenant man who Jesus hadn't come down and hadn't provided these things. Heaven hadn't moved on the inside of you. And so you had to get your prayers through these demonic oppositions to heaven. But now... God lives on the inside of you. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray, so you can look at God. You say, Father, amen. People will say things like, that prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayers to get above your nose. God lives right here. This whole concept of I've got to do spiritual warfare is people that don't have a good relationship with God. They aren't walking in the Spirit. They think that God hasn't done anything until it, the doctors can prove it, until the bank account reflects it. They don't know what's going on in the spirit. Most people are only evaluating things in the natural. They can count how many heads are in this room and tell you how many people are in this room, but they don't have a clue about the angels of God and the spirit of God and the awesome power of God. They just are operating by carnal things. Most people can tell you what they look like, whether they're tall or short whether they're fat or skinny, whether they're male or female, they can tell you things. They can describe themselves to you, but most Christians couldn't give you a clue of who they are in the Spirit. They're operating in the physical realm, and because they don't feel it, well, I don't care what the Bible says. The Bible says I'm healed, but I'm telling you I'm sick. That's because you're carnal. Amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. I know some of you, uh, this isn't blessing you, but I'm trying to help you. I'm telling you, in the Spirit, you've already got it. And we spend so much time looking at what we don't have in the natural and what I don't feel, and God, my bank account isn't full, and I've got, the, and we think that that's reality. I'm telling you, if you think only what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel is reality, you're only playing with half a deck. There is a spiritual world that exists, and I am saying that you've already got it. In the Spirit, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. This terminology, in Christ Jesus, is referring to who you are in the Spirit, the born-again part of you. And in the Spirit, every one of you is awesome. In the Spirit, every one of you is identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. You have His anointing. His wisdom, His faith, His power, His ability to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. You've already got healing for everything. You've already got everything. Anything you need is in there. It's like Prego spaghetti sauce. Do you ever see those commercials? Somebody say, but I want basil. And it says, it's in there. But I'd like oregano. That's in there. It's all in there. In your spirit, whatever you need, it's in there. You've already got it. Anything you need today, you've got it. Did you know if you really understood that, I can guarantee you it would be impossible for you to be depressed? I meet people all the time saying, but oh, I'm so depressed, would you pray, pray for me? And I say, I say There's, my emotions just don't work. Your emotions work perfectly. You know what? If you...